Zaman kita muda, iklan Guinness Stout bersepah. Ingat tak? Iklan dalam bahasa Melayu pula tu. Pernah nampak? Dalam iklan tu, mesti ada perempuan Melayu pakai kebaya seksi. Dulu kita semua pun pakai seksi lah. Tiap hujung minggu, mesti ada parti kat rumah-rumah orang. Time tu lagu disco masih hot. Pesen rambut kita awak, besar. Macam pagoda. Seluar, bell bottom. Kadang-kadang, dalam tangan kanan, pegang beer. Hello, my name is Nabila Syed and I'm a poet and playwright from Singapore. Today, it's my pleasure to take you through this exhibition, Latif Mohidin Pago Pago, a solo exhibition by a Malaysian painter and poet Latif Mohidin, also known as Pak Latif. This exhibition runs till 27 September 2020 in the gallery. This exhibition features over 80 paintings and artworks from Latif Mohidin, as well as images and films drawn from private and public collections in Singapore and Malaysia. This is part of Art Plus Life, an acrostic series which invites writers, poets and playwrights to respond to the works in the National Gallery. Later, I'll give you a provocation and invite you to respond with your own piece of creative writing. I chose to share the earlier monologue from my play Drip, especially in contrast to Jogit, an oil painting that Pat Latif did in 1960 when he was just 19. In this painting, you can see three Malay women who are actually dancing in unison. It appears that they are dancing a Malay dance style known as the Zapin. Pak Latif had actually taught from um, Singapore artists during that time Liu Kang and Ho Kok Ho when he was living in Singapore from 1949 to 1954. You can actually see from the colours and techniques that they are similar to those of the Nanyang artists. With the Nanyang style and Pak Latif's own developing style, we see a centering of Southeast Asian life and culture in art. Pak Latif is capturing a scene that's familiar to him as a Malay person. Joget to me is especially appealing because of how it moves away from the exoticized gaze of the other. In a gesture of demureness, maybe even subservience, I detect a quiet dignity in this woman, a secrecy and an invitation that is ultimately powerful. Some of you might be wondering what Pago Pago means. I alluded to it in my opening monologue, the pagoda or more accurately, the pagoda, the German term for pagoda. Between the years of 1960 and 1969, Pak Latif actually left Singapore and his hometown in Seremban, Malaysia to study in Berlin. In the ethnographic museums in Berlin, he discovered relics from the Nusantara, Thailand and Cambodia, conjuring up images of nature and the architecture of temples that are unique to these regions. As a Minangkabau person, he was also thinking of the Paga Paga, the supporting structures that can be found in the traditional Minangkabau homes. From these, he created the term Pago Pago, a unique combination of East and West, of man-made construction and natural formations. In 2018, when I was still studying my postgrad in playwriting, I visited Paris and went for this same exhibition by Latif Mohidin when it was on at Son Pompidou. It was actually the museum's first solo exhibition by a Southeast Asian artist. I remember going to this exhibition and I wrote a review. In the review, I wrote about how I could imagine Pak Latif being a flaneur, exploring cities that he visited on foot as he travelled further and further away from home. I remembered feeling a bit unsure if I should use this term flaneur, which was written about by the French poet Charles Baudelaire in his book, The Painter of Modern Life. This was because the Minangkabau people actually have their own term for travelling away from home, merantau. Why should I use a French word when a Malay term already exists? I don't usually do this, but I decided to email Pak Latif to share with him my review and connect with him in some way. I was pleasantly surprised to receive his reply. Your opening lines of first paragraph is really uncanny, he said. I tell you why. On 2nd March 2018, on my last evening of my stay, the director of Pompidou, Mr. Bernard, drove me round to see Paris by night. As we were enjoying the lit-up buildings by the River Seine, I made this remark spontaneously. Baudelaire used to walk alone late at night to early morning when Paris is empty and dark, alone. Flaneur, Flaneur, he wrote. Like both Flaneur and Marantau, 
there's something about the ease with which Pat Latif carries all these references, these images and ideas within him and shares it with us through his life and his work. His travels would see him returning to Southeast Asia, later to New York as well. Along the way, he would learn German and pick up Italian and French. His good friend Ismail Zain would call what he had a vernacular cosmopolitanism. On the one hand, one can declare this an act of resistance, of moving away from the dominance of the West, of fiercely claiming one's identity, of decolonizing and agitation. But I equally feel that his work carries a sense of fluidness and ease in them, an ease that is no less energetic, nor is it inactive. These two forces, push and pull, construction and destruction, are present in Pat Latif's works in a way that is often deceptively simple. In fact, some people have mistaken his works to be primitive. Take a work like Karam or Shipwreck. What looks like overturned ships also features shapes that come from the natural world, that of the pandan leaf. The image on first glance appears flattened, but deliberately so. It invites you to look at what lies beneath. How can you read into the complexity of the image beyond its seemingly simple lines? The sensitivity and respect for our natural and physical world is definitely a hallmark of Pat Latif's Nusantara and Southeast Asian roots. But he was also equally taken by German nature poetry and German naturalistic philosophy. In later years, he came to be known as nature's poet. He also co-founded an artist collective known as Anna Alam or Child of Nature. Drawing from nature is something that can be seen in Malay literary and artistic tradition and culture. In Malay Peribahasa or idioms, we see a lot of motifs of flora and fauna. The harmonious bamboo shoot, the humble stock of paddy, how a boat parts an ocean. These all become rich resources and reminders of how humans can live rich and meaningful lives. In the Malay Pantun, a four-line poetic structure, the first two lines, known as the Pembayang or Foreshadower, often feature elements from nature, followed by the next two lines that reveal the maksud or message of the poem. This is a poem I wrote uh, previously. I'll first read it in Malay. Ayam jantan berkokok lantang, di tepi sungai diri berlagak. Apa mak saleh boleh lakukan, orang Melayu pun boleh juga. Now in English. The rooster, he crows noisily as he poses beside the river swell. What Westerners do fairly easily, Malays can execute just as well. Pak Latif's work came out of a rich dualistic, or more accurately, if we break beyond the binary of East and West, a pluralistic world of references and influences that he drew from and gained from his travels all around the world and deep study and reverence for what he saw in every country that he lived in. Still, he never forgot his kampung roots. His Pago Pago series and philosophy can be seen as his way of challenging the dominance of Western modernism at the time. Pat Latif himself recalled, I went to Europe because I believe I could get from the West a technical virtuosity. From the East, I wanted wisdom and intimacy. I'll now like to share with you a poem I wrote recently titled Nene is Lucid Dreaming. Nene is lucid dreaming. Does Nene remember driving her daughter away? When my parents fled, a thousand crabs migrate au clair de la lune. I imagine the critters caught in their songkit. Nasi minyak kat negeri orang putih ada cengkeh tak? When abang sunat, Nene said he walked funny, like crab pakai sarung. Does she know all her descendants will betray her? She can always tell when my lady skips a line while reading the Qur'an. My GD wraps me in his dhoti when I was too young to remember. We eat lemak ketam chili padi before I learn how to take the spice, sweets from his shop on Saligi. Nanny sings me a song, Pakitong Kitong. I remember Ali Mango and forget her. I dream in Khmer numbers, German conjugation. My mother drives us away with her dreaming. Ismail Zain delivered a speech in 1989 in which he says of his friend, One time, he had a French beret tilted on his head and a grubby army jacket which he had seen many years. He was mustachioed and bearded and always feverish. And this fever is intrinsic to Latif. 
in my entire life, I've never known Latif without this fever. I bring this up because like lucid dreaming, this fever of Pat Latif to me is an active one. Even if it's in affliction, it is kinetic. It has its own energy, one that both radiates outwards and pulses within. Perhaps as a Malay person in Singapore, there is always this rootedness to the Nusantara, to the larger Malay archipelagic region that is a source of this energy. Yet my identity as a Singaporean is equally informed by our openness to the West, by our history as an entrepôt trading centre. In 2019, I presented a play titled Angkat, a definitive alternative reclaimed narrative of a native. It was a play in which I attempted to write the Singapore story from the perspective of a Malay person. I wrote of my play, What is Angkat? It is everything. It is majalah gila-gila and a fever dream. It is feverishly dreaming. It is history and unhistory. It is unmaking and remaking history and imagined futures. It is baggage. It is nothing. It means everything and it means nothing. In this island life, there's a sense of both claustrophobia and an inherent desire to be the centre of everything. A fever dream that is both an internal affliction and a projection. For this exhibition in Singapore, Pak Latif has created a new work, a hand-drawn map of Kampung Glam as he remembers it from his time in his childhood, having grown up in Java Road. While it's largely accurate, the map is more of a social sketch of memories, people and places that he remembers from 1949 to 1954. I spot things that are no longer around anymore. Alhamra Cinema, Kampung Glam Radio Service, Kota Nongchi and even a Nasi Rawan stall. Mind map. On this road, our pinafores race to the finish line. We cut corners, chewing airheads into impossible shapes. In snakehead buses crawling in peak hours, the curry puffs were half eaten. The roads needed new asbestos coats. With each bell, we molted. This right turn is where we stared life in the face. Here, in the span of a roundabout, our fortunes unspooled to mirror our insides. We dared to dream, only in the field, pretending never to notice the fences. I'll now like to invite you to engage in the acrostic practice with me. Taking this hand-drawn image of Kampung Glam as a point of departure, I would like to ask you to write a poem or prose that acts as a memory map. How might you map an image, a place, or even a memory in words? For example, you can start with the words, here is where, or here was where, and see where that takes you. Try not to be fixated on accuracy. Instead, lean into your natural imagination. In this time, when physical movement might be restricted, it might actually be freeing to allow yourself to dream and imagine alternate worlds. Like Pago Pago, you can even create new words for yourself and use that as the title of your poem. My name is Caroline Liu, and I'm inspired to write this poem when I look at the map that Latif Mohidin had drawn. It was hand-sketched as if from memory. He had drawn the streets and put down the names of the streets. He had also put buildings on the map, and these are very familiar buildings in his mind. They stand out in his mind when he thinks of Kampung Glam and what is there. Maybe it represents to him a home away from home. Maybe a home from the stories that his parents had told him. Quite a lot of us are immigrants here in Asia. We bring our memories, but as we decide to stay on, we also build our own memories. The streets of my father. The streets of my father seem far away, of places where he used to stay lined with rows of many trees that run all the way to the sea. Slowly, we build our lives in this new home. The children never get lost as they see the dome. We decided here we lay our plans for the future. The core of our home in this picture. Hi, I'm Sam. Latif Moedin's hand-drawn map inspired me by getting me to think about belonging and about place and about the past and the romanticization of the past and how the past still seeps into the present. I was thinking about the first time I went to the Kampung Glam area, or at least properly went there. And I was exploring with my friend. She brought me to a lot of some of like the back alleys and cafes and ice cream and also the Malay Heritage Center. And we took a lot of time to really look at all the street art around. 
and this poem is inspired by a photograph I took of her in front of a mural of roses. She very nicely helped me find the street name. It's called The Roses on Muscat Street Got Real Bored During Circuit Breaker. Here is a canvas, wooden, painted with roses. They're pink and red and romantics at heart, grown out of the frame after some time had passed. Spilled onto the floor towards the palace, entered the lobby, grabbed the brochure. They pat their vines on the floor mat, feeling demure. Take the lift ke Pangung and curiously explore. It takes him three months to digest it all. When the staff return to the museum, empty displays and a flat rose greet them. Hello, my name is Tina, Tina Nixon, and um, I have been asked to write a poem in response to an image that I was sent. Um, I was very excited by the image and rather more daunted by the prospect of having to write a poem in response, um, especially since I haven't written any poem poetry since uh, school days. Um, but I accepted the challenge and actually I was surprised that the poem flowed relatively easily and quite quickly, except for the last line. And um, I got real writer's block when it came to the last line. But anyway, here we go. My poem is called The Winds of Change. A handkerchief painted in time of the narrow and ordered streets of Kampongalam, a place where new and old combine, and a trip down this memory lane, a time when there was more hustle and bustle, and a time when there's also not much to do, except to explore the trodden paths of nostalgia. Thank you for watching an Ekfrastic series. You can share your own creative writing responses with the hashtag GalleryAnywhere. My name is Nabila Said, and you can find my writings on artsequator.com or nabilasaid.com. I'm also on Instagram at Nabicat. Thank you and take care.